and and this actually is sort of a pivot point for the for the course um or kind of lines up with that in the sense that we're gonna we're gonna jump into real endogenous growth models now okay so now we're with that a which is previously um just growing exogenously is is we're gonna endogenize that uh uh first a little bit and then and then kind of fully okay so um yeah i guess I can't remember, so, but I do remember last time we were doing some of this computational stuff, okay? Um, and I think essentially uh, we got through it. I mean, I had, to, I had to sort of rush a bit at the end, but I think we basically got through most of it, okay? Um, in terms of, you know, first we did, I think we did all of the the Ramsey reverse, uh, reverse time trick and all that, okay? So I think that's pretty good. Um, and then we went into doing stuff with Jax. Okay, so um, maybe, okay, let me see. Yeah, okay, so so basically I, I you, this, this is gonna be slightly pixelated, but I'm not really gonna go over it. I'm just gonna kind of like use it as a, as a sort of reference. Okay, but but this is what we were looking at last time, you know, where we were, um, if I go up here, going through all that stuff with Jax and, and how to, uh, you know, sort of construct functions, take derivatives of them, and what does it mean you know, how, how exactly do things play out in terms of like the shapes basically? Cause it, you know, the, at the end of the day, you kinda, it, it gets tricky to track what's the shape of the thing that you're dealing with, okay? But if you have a function that maps from a vector into a scalar, okay? So just like a likelihood or a best fit function, uh, some kind of loss function, um, then uh, if you take the gradient of that, you're gonna get out a vector too of the same shape as the input, okay? Because you know, each individual input you can you know, move around and that's going to change the output okay and so and then you can you know you could take you get a hessian which would give you a matrix right okay of uh, if you change index a b or like ij i guess um and that's like the whole matrix okay um or you could you know equivalently if you had a, a scalar output function then you could take the gradient of that and that would give you a matrix okay because you have the, the 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 matrix is is indexed by which output you're looking at and which input you're changing okay and so they're like the cross, the jacobian cross derivatives okay um so uh yeah so this sort of that can get tricky okay but as long as you kind of go slow and be careful you know you can keep track of the shape of everything okay and sort of the practical import here is that we can um we can write stuff uh you can write stuff in a very simple almost you know symbolic way sort of just like a simple logical way um and then you know say i want to know what's the derivative of this or i just want this to go fast let's just in time compile it so that we don't we don't suffer as much from this uh pythonic slowness sometimes okay so um so that's that's good that you can keep things close to the way that we think about them mathematically okay um and then the other thing you do in addition to, to taking derivatives and such and, and, and compiling is is vectorizing okay so you can write something that said you can write something that says okay you know for you could do something like um what's a good example you you could write like a ramsey updater like a, a to move through the differential equation space but then you could also um vectorize it in the sense you could you could do it for like multiple different economies with different parameters all at the same time okay maybe they have different like productivities or something like that okay that would be the the next dimension is these you know having different productivity levels okay and you can vectorize that so that you, you're basically solving the whole thing all at once with with just a higher one extra dimension and it'll sort of like figure out how to do that okay but you don't have to think about okay now this thing used to be a vector this thing used to be a number a scalar and now it's a vector it used to be a vector now it's a matrix it figures all that out for you with with this vmap thing that, that we we looked at last time okay so that's, I think those are all sort of useful uh, tools. Okay. And then, um, in the, in the, in the file here, I have, um, yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, I mean, I won't go over it in too much detail, but, but, you know, you should check it out if you have a chance at some point, but, um, in the file, you know, basically it's a very simple discrete time value function iteration. Okay. Um, where you're, uh, you're defining some parameters, defining a grid, finding steady state. Okay, because we still we still need to kind of know steady state if we want to create because we want to be sure that the steady state is included in our grid. Okay, so that's why you kind of need to know at least a rough idea of where steady state is. Okay, because you want that your grid to be kind of centered centered in the right place. And I usually do it so that I find steady state and exactly construct the grid precisely around that because of course that's where all the action's happening. Okay, so um, 
Yeah, then you define your utility function um, and your production function. Okay, just, just keep in mind that sometimes, you know, for instance, with the logarithm, you can't use exactly log C because it could, if C goes negative, then all of a sudden things, things kind of blow up. Okay, so you, you do need this. Usually people set a minimum level of C, like 10, 1 to the minus 10 to the minus 4 or something very small that you'd never encounter anyway. Okay, so, um, but that ensures that, because like, when you start out with a guess, the guess might be wrong, and that might lead you to weird places. Okay, and you just make sure, you need to make sure that in your meandering drift towards convergence, you're going to end up in potentially weird places. So you need to make the system kind of robust to that possibility. Okay, um, okay. You can also this this one I found it, but actually I was I realized that you can you can make it so it's like a log. And it, like at some point, it just becomes like a linear extrapolation of where it was. Okay, and that's even better because if it's like this and then it goes flat, it's like it's not um continuously differentiable. But you can do a continuously differentiable version where instead of going flat, it just goes flat in slope, and then just becomes linear after that. And you can even evaluate negative numbers there. Okay, so not a big deal, but you know it it, it does help a little bit. Okay, so um and then this is really the core, right? This is the this is that value. This function is the value function updater. It's your inductive step. Okay, it'll it'll bring you from guess number you know j to guess number j plus one, and so on and so on, and you just keep iterating that until you hopefully converge. Okay, um, and it's just you know it's arg arg max and max. You, you you get the matrix of I'm at k today, uh, and I may and I'm at some somewhere at k prime tomorrow, and that that's a, that matrix you know for any today and tomorrow pair, it'll tell you what's your uh, output, right? What's your consumption because you know how much you produce and how much you're you're pulling out for investment and so on. Okay. So you can get all of that. So you basically get a consumption matrix, throw that utility function, throw on beta plus the value for the next period and, and you're all set. Okay. And I think the only tr the, the tricky thing sometimes here is is how do you construct next period value? Because next period's value is a function of K prime, your your capital tomorrow. Okay. And next period's value is a a one-dimensional thing. It, it's just the it's it's the value function, right? Um, or the previous guess for the value function, I guess. Uh, so it's 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 just like k. It, it exists in a k dimension. You're evaluating it like at k prime, okay? Um, and so if you think you have this on the consumption utility side, you have a matrix k. You know, let's say k in the row dimension, k prime in the, the column dimension. Um, you want to get the value in in like a matrix amenable form, okay? Right, for k prime. Okay, so that that's why we have this done here. We're saying for the k dimension, it's constant. Okay, so we're just we're just going to kind of like make it like a, a a one by n sort of thing. Okay, so for the k dimension, it's constant, and for the k prime dimension, that's where we're actually running through the specific values. Okay, so it's just because we're we have this matrix of utilities, we want to add on a vector, but we need to make it like a a matrix, but just like a one row matrix, and then Python will figure out how to to broadcast those together. Okay, but you do need to like upgrade it to a matrix. Okay, so that's all that none stuff here. That's that's what we're we're, we're upgrading that to a, a, a sort of a trivial matrix. Okay, uh, then you have a matrix of your 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 actual objective value for k each k and k prime, and you you look at the max in the k prime dimension, right? So for each k, you're choosing the max in the k prime dimension, and that and this is in some sense this is the most important part because. This is where you're vectorizing, right? You're vectorizing in the sense that you're computing the max over k prime for every k at the same time. You're not saying, okay, look at the first grid point, search through all the k primes, find that, go back, store it. You know, you're you're you created this matrix, and you're just saying find the max in a, in the the k prime dimension, and then you get back these vectors. Okay, so you're, you're, that's that's vectorization basically. Okay, so you get the the maximal sort of choice, the index of the choice. You get the maximal value. You get the actual capital level at the choice if you if you want, okay, instead of the, the index of the capital, the actual direct capital level. And then you, you can store that or output it or whatever, and you just uh, compute a, a max absolute error between the guesses uh, today and the previous guess and the current guess to see how close you are to convergence. And like, uh, yeah, usually they, people use max absolute error. You could use mean squared, max squared, whatever you want, but that's what people normally do in value function space. Um, okay, and then you you solve it. You can pre-compute some stuff. Um, 
I think I went over this mostly. It's, it's just here. That scan function here is, is the thing that does the induction. It's, you, you give it the inductive step, it'll iterate for you. Okay. Um, and that's better because, well, it's not, it, it's, it's okay. I mean, if you have a really long loop, it, it's, it's better for short loops. Maybe it's, it's similar in terms of execution speed, but, um, it can, it can be, uh, in a, in a lot of cases it can be better. Okay. So, um, all right. So we did that. We found that it's 15 times faster than, uh, if you compare just running the code, it, it has speed, you know, what, what was it? I forget. Uh, I thought that we had both speeds, but maybe I, anyway, um, if you just run it versus doing the JIT thing and then running in the compilation, it's 15 times faster if you do the compilation thing. So it's worth your time. Um, and I realized that that's, that's probably not even a fair comparison because even just pure JAX is, is going to be potentially faster than NumPy. Okay. So, um, if you did it in just regular old Python NumPy, I would guess the factor would be more like 30 to 100 or something like that. Okay, so it, it's substantially faster than just doing regular old NumPy, okay? Um, all right, and then the output, this is the last thing I'll, I'll say probably in this. The output is is a policy function. Well, one of the outputs, you, know, you get a value function. You get a, a thing that says, okay, for a given, I didn't label my axes here, okay? Um, you know, so, but but the, the axes here are uh, basically K on this axis and then K prime uh, on the one, K on the X axis, K prime, uh, sorry. Sorry, not K prime, K prime minus K. So it's it's K on the X axis and then how, how much you're moving on the, the Y axis. So so steady state is by definition is a zero uh, in, the, in the Y dimension, okay? And that's where I put this black dot. So, one thing is, okay, the black dot was computed analytically just before we did everything just from like a theory side, right? So the, it, it wasn't guaranteed that the black dot is on the, the blue line. The the fact that it is means that our algorithm kind of worked. Okay, it was, it's it's mostly accurate. Okay, so, so the approximations that we did were not too bad. Okay, so that that's one check you can always do is just take that, you know, whatever theory point, steady state point that you have, simple case and, and go back and, and double check that you're more complex algorithm actually reproduces that basically. Okay. Um, so it does. Now it's a little wonky because it's a, it looks kind of like a step function. And that's because we're doing an argmax over a grid. So you're like, you're moving through K space and you're like, well, this K prime was good before. And then you cross the threshold and say, now there's a new K prime. It's good. Okay. So you're, you're jumping around on a grid. We, we would expect this. Okay. So the next level up beyond this is, is interpolation. Okay. And so with interpolation, you still have your value function at a, at specific grid points, um, but you're going to say linearly or whatever, some kind of interpolation uh, that into a continuous function. And then you're going to choose A continuously given that uh, to maximize your um, objective up there. Okay. So you're going you're gonna to smooth things out and you're going to make a continuous choice and, th and then evaluate that continuous choice. And then you'll get a smooth, you would get a smooth policy function here where we have a step function. Okay. So there's many ways to interpolate stuff. You could just do it. I mean, piecewise linear is one way it's continuous. It's not continuously differentiable, but it's continuous or let me think that should be fine. So you, what you want to think about is if I do this interpolation, what is it going to give me in terms of a maximum? So sometimes if you just did a continuous, uh, uh, a piecewise linear interpolation on a grid, which is continuous, but not continuously differentiable, that might cause issues of still jumping around too much. Okay. So it depends on your problem. I think in this case, it's fine because you're trading it off against a continuous utility function. Okay. Um, if you think about like, uh, let's see. Yeah, the, the continuity, the, the continuity of your utility function as you increase K prime, right? You're going to decrease consumption and decrease utility today. And then you're going to increase K, as you increase K prime, you're going to increase the value side beta times V tomorrow, right? So those are going to trade off and, and it'll give you a continuous outcome. Okay. Um, which is, which is good enough. Okay. So, so that's, um, that would be the next level up. Okay. Um, it'll get, at least give you something. It doesn't look wonky. All right. And it should be more accurate too. Okay. Um, 
And sometimes if you do that, you can then skimp a little bit on others. You can lower the number of grid points, perhaps, you know, if you have a target accuracy, you could do interpolation, but have less grid points or vice versa. So there's trade-offs too, um, in terms of like computational speed. Okay, so um, that, that would be the next step. And then uh, the only thing is in NumPy, you, or in any case, you can just, you can do that. You can do it in a vectorized way, okay? Um, it takes a little bit of, kind of a little clever sometimes about how you do it, but you can you can do interpolation in a vectorized way. You don't have to like loop or anything like that. Um, and uh, the, the only issue that arises is if, you know, part of the, the appeal of GX is that you're writing a program that can be differentiated, okay? So we could, the thing I wrote here can, um, can be differentiated, okay? Uh, in the sense of you have a, you're, the whole program is a mapping from parameters into uh, basically the value function outcome, the converged value function. Okay, so that's the whole program beginning and end, including all the iteration. You can take, with Jax, you can just say, take a derivative of that, okay? Um, did I not? Uh, so you see like this function solve, you can, you can just say like, take a derivative of that. Okay, so, um, see, so like solve is a function, okay? Um, and I can say, well, actually, okay, so, there's one step here that I forgot. Solve is a function, okay? It outputs uh, a bunch of stuff, okay? What what I would really want to do is take solve, which outputs the value function and the policy function, generate sort of choices from it, you know, like a, what's a capital choice? If, if I have this level of capital today, here's the capital level I'm going to choose tomorrow. Generate and, and sort of do that for like maybe particular K values, okay? And that'll generate like a prediction and then compare that to data. And at the end of the day, I want to create some kind of loss or likelihood function out of all of that, right? So I have this data that says, here's a bunch of people that had capital level K. Here's what they chose in terms of K prime. That's my data. On the model side, I'm going to say, okay, take K as given, generate predictions for K prime, okay? And then compare data and model K prime, like least square, um, some square differences or something like some kind of reasonable loss function, okay? Which would be like if I had normal error it would be a likelihood okay so um i can't just call it unsolved directly okay because solve is returning it's not even just solve it's returning a vector it's returning like a dictionary of vectors and, and all this information about the system okay so um yeah i don't have time to do that but you can do it all right and then once you know and, and once you do that it'll, it'll figure everything out for you okay but then the the one thing is um because we're not interpolating, okay, that can cause issues because because uh, we're jumping. Okay, so think about like, think about this policy function here. If think about differentiating it, if I move a parameter a little bit, that, that changes the system. If I'm on this level area, if a very small changes on that level area, nothing is changing in terms of the prediction, right? So it, it, the derivative is zero. And then once, but then once I hit the threshold, then all of a sudden the derivative is huge, right? So the derivative is gonna be like huge and then zero. And it, so it's not gonna be friendly to an optimizer, okay? So that's why we would interpolate. If we interpolate, we can smooth it out. And then when we take a derivative of the whole system, things are moving around smoothly, okay? So the interpolation, it's not just kind of ugly. So the lack of interpretation isn't just sort of like it generates an ugly looking graph. It, it generates weird derivatives that are not useful for optimization. Um, and are not accurate in some sense. Okay, so uh, so that that's another reason to maybe even the best reason to to interpolate is that you may need it for for actually uh, differentiating things. Okay, so um, yeah. Okay, but then uh, I guess um, I'm trying to think of the, if anything we can take it. I, I guess we could take a we could try to take the Jacobian of like. The value function. Let me, let me see what uh, what are, what are you outputting? Solve. You're outputting b. Okay, good. I don't know. I don't know if this is gonna work. I really don't. But let's try it. Um. Let's do like a short iteration. Okay, that gave me something. Mm. Okay, and then so so what this is saying just to we're saying call solve on on a given parameter 
set D. So that would be like alpha, delta, rho, all those folks. With a time horizon of 20, just because I want to keep things simple here, um, with 20 iterations, which is not enough, but it'll be fine. Um, and then look at the output and specifically look at the value function that's output. Okay, so that's going to be like a grid, you know, for each k grid value, we're going to have a value function value, all right? That, so this is like a little mini function inside here, okay, that I created. The inline. And I'm saying take the Jacobian of that. So it outputs a vector, take the Jacobian, it's going to take the derivative uh, with respect to all that stuff. Okay, um, so that's test. Um, and then we're going to, that's a gradient function. So it maps from parameters, the input number vector into output, which is going to be something like a Jacobian. And I think, sorry, I'm scrolling up here. I think I called that parameter set pair zero. I did. Okay. This may work. It may not. I don't know. It may. It worked. Okay, so so it's it's um it gives us why so what does it give us? It gives us a Jacobian, but actually we're in a weird space here because that that um that parameter thing was a dictionary. Okay, so it's like it's taking the Jacobian with respect to say the derivative with respect to z. So it's saying what if you change the uh productivity a little bit, how does that change um the whole value function at every single point? Okay, so um, we can look at, like, let's, let, let's look at just the Z. So this, this is saying, you know, change Z, you get like a whole Jacobian. Change alpha, you get a whole Jacobian. So it did everything kind of at once, but let's just look at that Z one. All right, and so this is, um, <clears throat> so, so this is saying if we change Z a little bit, remember Z is a number, okay? then how is our value function going to change? And actually this value function is, it's the whole history of iterations. It's not just the last one. So that's why it's 20. We did 20 iterations. There are a hundred capital grid points. So that's why it's 20 by a hundred. In general, I, I don't really care about anything but the last iteration because that's like our solution, right? So, so here I could have also said like, only look at like the last one, right? And then when I do this, that'll just give me like, just for that last iteration, which is sort of ostensibly the solution, I'll get I'll get a derivative. So this is saying specifically now this vector is saying for every single point on that grid, if I change the productivity z a little bit, how does my value function change? Okay, and then I, I could do the the same thing for like the policy function. Um, okay, uh, sorry. Oh, yeah, so that, that makes sense. I do the same thing with the policy function. It says zero. I, I was surprised, even though I told myself like five minutes ago that I would get this outcome. This is the lack of interpolation. Okay, so this is really saying we changed Z, but we did, it's, it's, it's that just on that level area, right? So we, we did, we're, it's just flat. Okay, so this is, this is the problem of the lack of interpolation. So the value function will change uh, because other stuff's going in that's not just the max. Although that value function derivative will also be wrong, it'll at least be not zero. Uh, this one will really give you zero because nothing is changing on that level surface. Okay, so yeah, that's that's what you can do. I mean, I think it's it's kind of powerful. Okay, um, to, to be able to do this, you can scale it up pretty quickly. Um, I was there's and there's this whole uh, this there's this whole like kind of new-ish literature. Um, that they're doing deep learning on like reinforcement learning. Okay. Um, and a lot of it looks a lot like this value function iteration stuff. So if you look up like this thing called Q learning or double Q learning, where they're, they're, they're basically doing value function iteration and value function solutions, but they're looking at like, if you're playing like a video game and your state space is like, you know, where you are in the world and your, your observations are like the pixels on the screen. Okay. So they're, but they're basically doing the exact same thing. This, uh, value functions, Bellman equations, and stuff like that. So um, it, it's, it, yeah, so I think there is some, there is also some crossover there uh, because they're looking at really high high dimensional state space problems. Um, and, and, and you might think that, okay, well, we don't have that in econ necessarily, but um, maybe we should. Maybe we're, maybe, you know, we econ folks get attacked for, for having thing, a simplistic view of the world. Maybe we can have a more sophisticated view of the world now. Um, and then the other thing is actually we do kind of often do that. So if you think about not just like a, a single agent setup, but a, a multi-agent heterogeneous agent setup, there the state space gets really big because you need to say, where is person A? Where's person B? Where's person C? And what's the whole 
cross distribution of that. Okay, that's a really high dimensional object. Okay, so you you do actually hit high dimensional spaces pretty quickly in econ uh, in macro, and um, and so so maybe it is it is sort of useful to think about that. Okay, so um, yeah, so that's where we're at uh, in terms of jacks and computation. Um, I think maybe we should we should do a little. We should do something with this, okay? So, I, I, uh, probably on the next one, Mark, I'll have like one problem on computation, okay? So, I don't know, maybe, maybe we could do interpolation. Um, that could be fun. Then we can get real derivatives out of this thing. Uh, or we could do, yeah, maybe we'll probably do like um, interpolation and then like a simple data matching exercise. You, you have this data somehow that you see. A, a bunch of units like countries that had, and when I say data, I mean data that I'm just going to make up, uh, simulate. Uh, you have a bunch of you know units or countries that have a given capital level, and then we see their next their investment rate, right? And then we're going to match that data. Okay, um, and you'll see. It, it actually, I think doing that exercise would be useful because it'll make you think about okay, what we're we assuming are we assuming they all have the same productivity or like where is the heterogeneity coming from and stuff like that. So like once you start going down that road, it actually does prompt some. Some sort of some real practical questions about how how do we do this, right? So this so in this case, um, we will we will what we would be interpolating is the that v prime. So the the you have u you know u of c plus beta v v of k prime. We're going to interpolate that uh, the v of k prime part, okay? And then the, the piecewise linear is just like, you have, you know, specific points for, well, I guess it should be, which way, I don't know, up, you're, yeah, yeah, yes. Right, exactly, so yeah, it's like a convex hull kind of thing, yeah, or yeah, convex line. So you, you just draw a line between each adjacent point, and that's your, it's gonna give you some sort of like, yeah. So that's one, the next step up, for, and the, the Potential issue with that. Well, the good thing is continuous. The potential issue is that it's not continuously differentiable uh, because it, it it has kinks. Yeah. So and you any yeah. So anytime you have anything but three lines that are perfectly lined up, which is like generically not the case, you're going to get a kink, right? So the next step up from that is uh, cubic spline, probably or some some something like a spline um, where where you can. You can basically, so, so it's like a characterization thing. This is like, if you want to come up with the simplest way to, to make it continuous, you know, to just drawing lines between adjacent points is sort of the simplest way. The next step up is saying, oh, now I want it to be, yeah, continuously differentiable. Wait, wait, what did you say? Okay, yeah, yeah, No, no, that's, that's, yeah, I mean, we should, we should do things in the simplest way possible if we can get away with it. Yeah, until they don't work. So here, you know, maybe you're doing it, and the the lack of the kinks, the jumps in the derivative are are proving problematic. And you, know, I want this to be smooth, um, and so that's where I th I think splines are what's called splines are the simplest ones. So essentially, instead of looking at pairs, I think this is the right way to describe it. Instead of looking at pairs and saying I'm going to draw a line between these, you look at successive triplets. So you look at the three you know succeeding points, and you draw. Uh, a quad, I guess you would draw a quadratic between them, and then you have you have um, uh, constraints basically that they should be this have the same value and derivative, and you can generate the correct coefficients for all of those such that it's it's continuously differentiable. The problem with that can be sometimes I think uh, you can get a, the the question is if you put it a monotone grid, do you get out a monotone function with the splines? With certain splines, you can actually get like a monotone grid, but a non-monotone function. Like think about like a cubic thing. Sometimes you might get like a little bit of that cubic action happening, even though the grid is monotone. Yeah, exactly. And on the ends, and endpoint uh, performance is sometimes an issue because you don't have, you're kind of extrapolating a little bit. So there, there's the various considerations once you get into these more sophisticated things. And there, there's not necessarily just one simplest way. Uh, you need to think about, do I care about monotonicity? We kind of care about monotonicity oftentimes. Is otherwise, our theorems about sufficiency break down. Yeah, so, um, yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, we have to do real thinking. I try to avoid that whenever possible, but 
it's 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 inevitable i think in this case so yeah uh yeah so you know the whole yeah rabbit hole you can go down there we're not going to go down it but but uh you could one could all right um i'm thinking we're going to do linear you can do more if you want but i'm, I'm thinking we'll do linear because uh especially if you want to make it truly differentiable yeah yeah it can get it can get it can get really complicated so we'll see though i mean um yeah but but probably we'll do linear okay um all right so i think that's it uh uh for the stuff for now okay so we'll 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 be visiting it on uh on the homework in addition probably to some nascent endogenous growth stuff okay so it'll be kind of a franken homework potentially we're going to do like some habitation and some endogenous growth but whatever we'll see um okay so speaking of let's let's jump into that all right let's 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 do endogenous growth so i am on a spaceship i want to be no actually i want to be here i just want to be in a different tab here we go um so this is actually this is the right place this is where i want to be uh let me move my zoom window here. So, so this is chapter five. Okay, chapter four was just the computation thing. It was like a six slide chapter, which seems kind of weird, but I don't know. I didn't have anywhere else to put it. Later on, and so, yeah, so chapter four is just like that value function stuff. Okay, just uh, continuous time, like actual value function, not Hamiltonian. Okay, so important. It's just like a little mini module. Okay, later on, I do also have this up on the on the, the website the stochastic processes thing you can think about the stochastic processes as like the continuation of that value function stuff because it's still it's also value function related um but it's like we have you know continuous random processes or jump processes happening and we're valuing like functions of those processes or things happening in the world of those processes okay so uh you can think about those as like sort of continuations um but for now we don't need to do stochastic processes yet. So we're just going to do kind of more, you know, like real, real uh, econ really stuff uh, and look at endogenous growth. Okay. So, um, all right. So uh, I guess, well, I'll start on the slides. I might, I might ultimately jump into the more of a free form iPad situation. Okay. But we'll, we'll start on the slides. Um, the, the system I have right now is, there's the growth notes, okay, which is basically, what, at, at some point last year, I, I switched into like, I didn't have time to make slides and I was just like writing like notes, like like long form notes. That still exists and it's called growth notes on the website. It's like the last link on the, the lecture thing. It has everything you could possibly want to know, okay? Uh, I'm converting those into slides basically. So I have I have a good lead already, so I don't, I don't think we're gonna run out of slides, but that, it. If you want to go to like the core reference, you know, the textbook is good. Um, but for a lot of the stuff, it's going to be growth notes on the on the website. Okay, but but these these here the slides are are, are um I'm making some good progress. Okay, so uh, and and we're definitely not going to get through this lecture, this this chapter today in in lecture. So uh, don't worry about that. Um, okay, so yeah, endogenous growth. All right, so um, I guess I kind of just jumped right into it. So here, here's how we're going to do this. Uh, we're going to endogenize growth, but slowly. We don't. If you you can't just fully endogenize growth because then things are going to get wild. We need to take this slow and careful. Make sure that we don't go off the rails and make sure that we understand every step that we're taking. Okay, and it's actually quite instructive, I think. So uh, we're going to do what's called semi-endogenous. Okay, uh, which is where, like the evolution so a is our technology a remember uzawa's theorem w log without loss of generality <clears throat> we can have uh, technology be labor augmenting okay that's kind of the background we're going to think about here now it doesn't have to be cop douglas production function it can be pretty much any production function although we'll usually assume uh constant returns to scale and such um but but that's the background when i'm talking about a that's usually what i'm talking about uh, in this setting, later on, A is actually going to be even simpler. We're not even going to have capital anymore. Okay, so we're going to kind of strip things down to their bare bones. But but for now, you can think about this A as, as something like that labor augmenting uh, tech, technology parameter in a in a in a 
yeah, in like the Ramsey setting. Okay, so um, all right. So, but what the semi endogenous step is is we're saying okay, well, a isn't just a dot equals some constant g times a anymore. Okay, it's going to be functions at least of other stuff. So it's not a choice on anyone's behalf. It's just like there's a new function that like tells us how this thing evolves. Okay, so this is like the solo step of endogenous growth, right? So solo, you have that constant savings rate, and then you go to Ramsey. This is like the solo, but like meta solo. Okay, so um, in the in the uh, technology space. Okay, uh, so so and th this first equation here here pretty much says it all. Okay. Um, so, which is that, that the rate of change of a, a dot is going to be some constant gamma. That's just an overall scale level productivity of research, uh, times a to the phi. So phi is some usually, well, it could be anything really, as long as it's a real number. Okay. For now, we'll, we'll, we'll narrow that down considerably. Um, uh, but think about it as some number, probably positive. Okay. Um, and then R is the, the research effort. Okay. So that can be. That's a little abstract at this point. At this point, but I, I usually think about it as uh, labor components of the number of researchers. Okay, uh, but in truth, research requires both labor and um, often capital and just raw goods input. Right. So um, <clears throat> yeah. So think about it as researchers for now, though. And then eta is is another sort of um, elasticity curvature parameter. Okay. So yeah. So that's what we're dealing with. Is and 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 the idea is. Um, the growth in technology has some dependence on past technology in the sense of, <clears throat> you know, you need to, there's a, there's sort of a chain. You need to understand step A before you move to step B, right? You, you can't, um, you, know, you can't do relativity without first understanding like Newtonian gravity, I think. Actually, maybe you can, but, you know, generally these things go in, in an order and you, you need to understand the, these fundamentals before you move on from there, okay? With, with the science or with the technology and things like that. Okay, so so the idea is you need these these previous A technology levels as inputs into new technologies, okay? So that's what that A to the five means. Now, <clears throat> um, and then the other thing is, this um, is gonna look similar, but it, I think conceptually it's slightly different is that you actually, you use old, you use tools that are built on using old technology to create new technology. Right. So you use computers, existing computer technology to help you with your research to generate new technology. Okay. So that's, you know, that's another way in which old technology feeds into the creation of new technology. Okay. So that's a, that's that, that's what that term is representing. What precisely phi is, is going to influence how we interpret that. Okay. Um, but as long as phi is positive, okay, you're, you're at least having better old or, or having a better existing base of technology um, leads to more creation of new technology, other things being equal, which I think is a reasonable thing, right? So this isn't saying like, because you might think, okay, well, if you have a really um, high level of technology today, it's tough to find uh, new technology because you've sort of taken all the low hanging fruit, you know? Um, and that that's that's real logic, okay? Uh, uh, but I think um, that that wouldn't push you all the way into phi being negative. It's not like having that technology like impedes your progress. It just makes it um, harder to come up with something genuinely new, okay? So that if you thought that was a big thing, that would push you towards like phi equals zero, but it wouldn't push you to phi negative. I guess is what I'm saying, okay? So I think it's safe to say that phi is positive, and we can argue about where it is in the positive realm. Okay, so so that's what I'll say for now. Um, and then with regards to the next term, r to the eta, that's a that's just a, a simple classic, you know, input researchers output is some concave function. Okay, so you have decreasing return, you have monotonicity increasing, decreasing returns is concave. Okay, so that's all we're we're capturing is that there's some there's some sort of production function style thing happening with r and the the output of research. And uh, you know, eta being less than one just means um, <clears throat> that you have more researchers, perhaps it's hard for them to coordinate. They may be doing duplicative stuff, which would look like concavity, okay? Because you know, if, if we both do research independently and come up with the same idea, that's half as much output as if we'd come up with a different, two different novel ideas in some sense, okay? So, so you can think about just duplicative stuff. You can think about it as there's a pool of people and you, you, you 
bring in as you bring in more researchers, you're going to be pulling from. Uh, you you get the best researchers first, and then you 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 move into the 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 less good researchers as you get more as you hire more, basically. Okay, so that's another thing which is sort of like um more along the lines of like uh, heterogeneity amongst the population. Okay, so they're they're going to look the same. Okay, the, it's just like some something has to induce in decreasing returns. What produces it? We don't really care. Okay, but it's just you know. Th those are the usual explanations and that's i mean those explanations apply for any well the duplicative one is probably more specific to technology but the the selection one the second one is, is i mean that, that you, you choose the best land to to cite factories first and then as you produce more and more you choose less less good land okay so that that second one is applies in almost any setting okay so um okay so then uh that's that's our that's our levels production function, production function for ideas, you could call it. Um, <clears throat> you can also think about it in terms of growth rates. Okay, so, you, and like, yeah, I mean, in some sense, it's, I think it's easy, it's better to think about it in terms of growth rates, okay? Because here you can really see, um, so divide, just take this, divide by A. And when you divide by A, B, B um, we're gonna move A to the, you're gonna get A to the five minus one, basically. We're going to move that into the denominator and make it one minus five. Okay. Just because um, we'll see why, why that's sort of a little bit more intuitive in a second. And so you can, you can see this thing about this is your growth rate. And, and what this is really saying is like um, the top side is just a gamma R to the eight is a, just a basic production function unit. Okay. And then on the numerator and the denominator is, this is where you, you really might see that, that um, the, how to think about the question of how does the current level of technology influence the the evolution of future technology and and what this says in terms of growth rates is that the critical value is one okay so if phi equals one right then this term disappears okay and you just get g is some function of how much you're inputting so the, the g is just a function of the number of researchers you have okay um if phi is less than one okay then having higher level of technology reduces sort of the potential growth. Okay. That that's really the, 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 that dynamic where, you know, having, having better technology makes it harder to come up with genuinely new ideas because you've already thought of so many ideas thus far. Okay. Um, and, and that, that, and, and there's where you can see like in terms of growth rates, the critical value is in fact one because you're kind of like, so here the critical value up top is, is something like zero, but because in growth rates, you're dividing another path, power of one, the critical value becomes one, okay? And because we're gonna be interested in continual growth, okay, it's probably better to think about it in terms of growth rates, okay? So, so and that that makes sort of the focal point is phi equals one. And, and we'll see that, that that's basically true, okay? So, um, yeah, right? And then uh, I guess, yeah, so if phi is greater than one, then, <clears throat> well then even in terms of growth rates, more, uh, better technology today means faster, larger growth rate. Okay, um, so we'll see that phi greater than one actually is pretty wacky. Okay, it's more like singularity territory. It's literally I'm going to show you that we, we get a singularity. Okay, so um, probably not going to go down that road. At least not today. All right. Um, okay. I, I mean, we're not going to go down that road in the sense of that's probably not the most realistic model because we're not really seeing a singularity. Okay. So, um, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I can, is it small or is it, is it, uh, like pixelated? Blur. Okay. Um, let me try the, let me try the same trick that I did before. Um, I think that should do it. So, uh, share my screen. Okay. How's that? Good. All right. Cool. Cool. Um, yeah, thanks for letting me know. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's weird. Cause it, well, yeah, I mean, from my side, I, I don't, I don't see it. Um, 
Oh no, okay, I can yeah, okay. I can I can I think I'm getting a preview of what it should look like. Okay, so so okay. All right, so then um okay, what do we have? Sorry. Now I'm dealing with this. There we go. Um okay, so we had this. All right, so the next slide, okay. We went through what you know what what are what are the important phi values? Phi one is sort of something happens there. Okay, so we're gonna kind of break it down into cases at this point. Okay. Um <clears throat> And we're also going to think about steady state. Okay, so so how should I, I mean basically this the steady state or the outcome differs depending on what your phi is. Okay, so I'll I'll just go through different cases. Um first let's think about phi less than one. Okay, this is gonna be kind of the reasonable case, basically. Okay, so we've already decided phi is positive, it's greater than zero, and now we're looking at that zero to one range, okay? And just could skip it back here. If we're, if we're thinking about the zero to one range, that growth rate equation on the bottom is kind of the best way to think about it. Okay. And we want to think about what's what's the steady state of this system. Okay. And essentially the, the dynamic that's going on is uh well A is going up, right? And so that denominator is providing a downward force, okay, because it's getting harder and harder to find new ideas, all right. Now, what's happening with the numerator? Well, we would hope that that's counteracting that to, to produce some steady state. Okay, so um, and this is why we're in this case the zero fight between zero and one case. We're actually going to need population growth. Okay, and we're going we're to need population growth, and then we're going to need to well, we're going to need to have researcher growth. Okay, we're going to have to have growth in the number of researchers, continual exponential growth. In truth, all right. Um, and, and one easy way to think about that is you have population growth and you devote a fixed fraction of your population to being researchers, okay? Or some, some. I guess it could vary, but like it's not going to zero basically, all right? So um, if you have that, then you have you have growth in the in the number of researchers too, okay? And if you have if you have that, then you have a situation where your uh, numerator is growing, okay? And if, if your population, let's say your population growth rate is N, okay? And then, um, let me, okay, so this this is probably a good point in which to yeah, add, right? So let's say your um, population growth. No, what did we get? All right, one second. All right, so first, yeah, this G growth rate equation that we have is. Uh, Gamma r to the eta over a to the one minus phi. Okay, and let's say your population growth rate is n. So n is l dot over l. Oops. Okay, um, and also let's say that r is some fraction s of l. I'm I'm doing s. I guess you're like saving, but with research or something. Okay, so uh, it's different from the solo s. But it's also between zero and one, and it represents uh, some sort of intertemporal trade-off. So let's go with it. Um, <clears throat> okay, so if that's the case, then well, you're also going to have that R is growing at rate n. Okay, um, and that's good enough for us. All right. So uh, okay, so then what's going to happen? Well, okay. So so if you just want to find steady state, you can you can just kind of logic through it, right? So. If we want g to be constant, okay, we need the, the the numerator to be growing at the same rate as the denominator, okay. The growth rate of that numerator is eta. I'm gonna get my eta's a long tail so I can differentiate them. N, uh, eta times n, okay, is the growth rate of that numerator. The growth rate of the denominator is gonna be one minus phi times the same g, the growth rate of a, so just g, right? Okay, so it's it basically. Um, yeah, so so it's 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 a little funky because we, we have we're trying to find the growth rate of g, but then we have this equation. It also has g, but then also this equation gives we can solve for g, right? So just divide through, and you're going to get you know g star is eta times n over one minus five, and that's it. Okay, so the uh, the idea is um, what's the idea? It's it's that well. It, Numerator and denominator should be growing at the same rate, first of all. Okay. The the numerator is just coming from population growth and whatever sort of 
concavity there is in that production function, the decreasing returns to scale from eta. And then the denominator to keep up, I mean, you know, you, you, uh, you're going to need that a has a particular growth rate mediated by one minus phi. Okay. And that's how you get this growth rate. Okay. Um, and so, uh, this is, I mean, th this is kind of the, the punchline of this, this whole thing. And this is, uh, I, should, I forgot to mention this, this is like a, uh, this guy, Chad Jones is sort of a well-known growth theorist at, um, Stanford, I think, um, he, he's done actually over the years, quite a, quite a few things, um, in the, in the, the, the realm of endogenous growth, but this is probably his biggest contribution, which is, is, is this really simple, just like writing it down like this and getting this, this result that the growth rate is some constant basically in the long run. Okay. So this, this is a steady state result. I'll show you the dynamics in a second, but in the long run, you get this growth rate. Okay. And I'll show you, it's going to be stable, everything like that. Okay. So you're going to get this growth rate in the long run. All right. No matter what happens. Okay. And as long as five is between zero and one. So this is, this requires five between zero and one. Okay. And, and this is interesting. First of all, the growth rate is proportional to population growth. Okay. So the, you need population growth to have long run growth because the stuff's getting harder over time. And if you have a fixed populace working your way up that technological ladder with that eight to the one minus five term, it's going to peter out. All right. You're just not going to be able to, to put enough effort into, to overcome that. All right. So you need a, a growing population. Okay. To get this long run, uh, technological growth. That's interesting, I think. Okay. So you, you might, um, and we'll, we'll, I mean, we'll see when that is and isn't true in a second, but as long as five is between zero and one, that's true. Okay. That's pretty reasonable space, I would say. Um, and so that's not to say that like, you know, this is a long run prediction and this is a system which may take a long time to equilibrate. So we might, you know, let's suppose that the, the, the world at some point, we just reached a maximal population. Then the prediction would be, we reach the maximum population. Technology gets hard, more and more and more difficult. We actually, the prediction would be, we, we, we'd converge to a, to zero growth eventually. We, we kind of keep growing, but just slower and slower and slower rate over time. Okay. Maybe that's the world. Who knows? Right. Um, uh, but the thing is we're, we're probably a long way from that. Okay. So in, in the interim, we're going to have something that looks like long run population growth. Okay. For the next foreseeable future, I would say even. Okay. So, um, so that's one thing is that, is that, you know, sort of like in the medium and long run, you kind of need population growth. Okay. Uh, to sustain technological growth. The other thing, which, which is really kind of the, the kicker is that this G star does not depend in any way on S. You might think a good way to influence the growth rate is to, to vary or say increase perhaps the fraction of people that are doing research, right? But that is not the case in this case, in this world, in the long run, at least that S has no influence on the growth rate, because if you put in more researchers, they do more research in the short run, they generate more ideas, but then that makes ideas in the future more difficult to find. And it just so happens that everything balances out and you'd get no long run effect. Okay. So um, <clears throat> now that doesn't mean there's no effect. I mean, in truth, what would happen is, you know, you get one of the things where you're going along at rate G star, you say, okay, well now we're going to bump S from 5% to 10%, which is already like much, much five. I mean, the S in the, in the, in the, the U S is like one or 2%. Okay, so that's that's pretty low. But let's say we're going, you know, let's say we double it. You're going to get an increase in the growth in the short run, but you're in inevitably going to converge back down to, uh, there we go, uh, converge back down to G star. So that's that's what it would look like. So the result is just that that long run, whether you're you know in the beginning or, or after the change, is going to be G star. But it doesn't say that you don't get some short run bump. Okay, so. Um, and if you want to think that's in terms of growth rates, if you want to think about it in terms of levels and growth rates, right? So let's say this, this would be, um, this is G, this is T. Let's say we thought about it in terms of log A. Okay. So going from G to log A, we're, we're basically integrating, right? Because the, the, the slope of the log is the growth rate, right? So the, the top graph 
is the derivative of what we think, whatever the bottom graph is going to end up being. So in other words, we can just integrate that top graph. So what that would look like is you're going along at a constant growth rate, which is linear in logs. You have a period of excess growth, and then you converge back to the same slope. So if you extrapolate this line, they're going to be parallel. Okay. So the idea is that you, with, with this change, you would generate a level effect, which is this distance here but uh, the, the, the uh, resulting slope would be different. Okay, so you, it, it's still, it still generates gains, right? It's just level gains rather than growth gains. Okay, so um, that, that was a surprising result at the time. Um, and, and, it's, and it speaks directly, you know, um, it, you know, people are often interested in increasing the rate of technological growth. Okay, and it kind of tells you what, what can you expect, okay? And, but it also, you know, if, if you're thinking about uh, sort of a more retrospective approach and you say, well, we did all of these changes. We, we did, uh, um, we changed the, we had like an R and D tax credit, which is a real thing. Uh, and that changed the number of researchers, but then the growth rate didn't change. Well, this is a retort to that saying, well, that, that doesn't mean it's bad. It just means that there's a, you know, there's a short run effect the level effect that has, which is permanent, right? So, so this thing, this difference between those two lines is in fact permanent. It's just, it's not a, a growth rate thing. So it, it also tells you how might you evaluate these, these policies. Okay. And, and if you just looked at the growth rate, you know, before the policy was enacted and the growth rate 20 years later and said they were the same, that's not sufficient to say that it wasn't a good thing or it at least requires more nuance in the analysis. Okay. So it also gives you a way to think about um, really evaluating policies uh, in, in the world. Okay. Um, all right. So, so that's that's five lesson one. So I guess um, how should we do this? So that and that's the steady state. Um, I do want to talk about the dynamics, but um, I also want to talk about phi equals one. Let's we're gonna do phi equals one. Then we're gonna talk about the dynamics in a more general sense. Okay. So and then and then. We'll probably be out of time after that. Okay, so let's turn over a new leaf here. Okay, so let's let's do this phi equals one case. So the phi equals one case is interesting because it, it gives you something that's sort of qualitatively different from the phi less than one <clears throat> world. Okay, so with phi equals one, well, we're gonna get g is equal to r to the eta and that whole a to the one minus phi term in the denominator disappears so we just get that that's it right um so now this is this is just qualitatively different right now before you had g star you converge there no matter what in the long run it didn't depend on s or r or whatever and you can you can you, know, you want to write this as gamma times s l to the eta right so, so that was the old world. The new world with phi equals one is it does depend on us. G depends on us very directly in a sort of the way you would expect a sort of a simple production function is you put in more researchers, get more growth. Okay. So, so in some sense, phi equals one is what you would otherwise expect it, um, from the get-go if you, if you didn't go through this whole sort of writing down the production function in that particular way. Um, <clears throat> And, and so the question is, is this reasonable? Uh, well, there's one kind of weird thing about this, which is that, okay, let's imagine we had population growth again. Now we have a growth rate that's a function of a thing that's growing exponentially. So the growth rate itself is growing exponentially. That seems bad. Okay, that's bad for business. Um, and it's not, definitely not what we see, okay? What we see in the data in terms of technology, we calculate the solar residual. Look at say the US or most countries, you see something approximating a straight line. Okay, which is to say that the, the growth rate is, is roughly constant. Okay. So we definitely don't see an exponentially growing growth rate. Okay, so um yeah. So the idea is either you have phi less than one between zero and one and population growth. Or you have phi equals one, but you have constant population. Okay, now I'm conflating population and researchers here. It is in principle possible to have a growing population, but a shrinking research share, such that your researcher number of researchers is constant, because the only thing that goes in here is R, 
right? So if, if S was going down and L was going up in such a way that R was constant, that also is fine, okay? With the, in, R has been going up for the US, okay? So, um, and in, in most countries, okay? So um, it's not, yeah, it seems like there is there is some growth in R, okay? So so that, uh, it, things don't look great for phi equals one, okay? But somehow, or another, uh, most endogenous growth models, even today that we see, have phi equals one. If you if you think about them as um, they're, they're complicated models, oftentimes, but if you if you think about them in their reduced form, where you just say, okay, well, at the end of the day, how much if you put in this amount of researchers, what comes out in terms of technological growth? You can usually reduce it to something simple like that, um, and if you do that, usually you find that their their sort of effective phi is is one, okay. And and the, and then to do that, they just have no population growth. Okay, so that's kind of and and the reasons for that. Well, it's just oftentimes it's much simpler to write that kind of model. Usually, what we're going to do is we're going to write down a model where where we're in a sort of phi equals one setting. Okay, um, and then see kind of what the implications are, and then we'll um, potentially introduce uh, a situation uh with phi less than one and see how that works out but the thing is that actually phi, having phi less than one does often kind of complicate things okay so um but the other thing is that like yes these are different kind of um th things are different in these two worlds with phi less than one and phi equals one uh it is true still though that you know in the, in the phi less than one world you increase s is your research share growth goes up, it just decays back to its original value eventually. And that might be a long time. Okay, so we'll see. Um, and then uh, in the phi equals one world, you you bump up S and it's just a permanent effect. Okay, so in the phi equals one world, it's just a permanent effect. In the phi less than one world, it, it bumps up and then it decays back down. So it, it's really just sort of, if the decay was really slow in the phi equals one less than one world, then maybe these two are not so different after all. Okay, so that's, so, that that's the basic logic is that you it's not like phi equals one it's just incurably wrong okay it's just an approximation and it, and it, it's often a lot simpler to solve and it can give us some intuition and if we really are worried about it we can we can add in that additional level, level of complexity um but we're going to start out with this this the, the simple version at first okay so um all right so that's that's phi equals one there's also a phi greater than one, which is that singularity I was talking about. So, but that, that really with that, we can, we want to look at dynamics. Okay. Cause there's going to be non-trivial dynamics there. So, so let's talk about the dynamics, but um, this is going to be general. So this is a, this is not for a specific phi case. Okay. So remember, so G is equal to gamma R the eta over A to the one minus phi. That's our that's our original growth rate equation. Okay. Now we can actually find the dynamics of this just by taking a growth rate of this equation. Okay. We're gonna take a growth rate of that whole equation. And so what that means is okay, the growth rate of the growth rate, g dot over gl. I'm I'm gonna I'm not gonna write g sub g, I'm gonna write g dot over g. It's just too confusing otherwise. We know how to evaluate this. It's just the growth rate of the numerator minus the growth rate of the denominator. Okay, so it's going to be eta. And let's say we have a situation where um, S is constant and we have population growth for now. So eta times N is the growth rate on top. And the bottom minus is one minus phi times G itself. Okay, so we just took a growth rate of the growth rate equation. We get another equation <clears throat> which describes the dynamics of the growth rate itself. It all, and without, there's no A in it anymore, right? Or R. It's all just G dot equals, in this case, it's going to be G times A to N minus 1 minus phi times G. Okay. So, <clears throat> all right. Uh, so what does this all mean? Um. Well, okay, so first of all, this actually tells us a bit about stability first. So um, what is stability? It's it's, it's being self-corrective. 
So if you look at this equation, look at the, the first row equation, saying if G is too high, the growth rate is going to be negative. If G is too low, the growth rate is going to be positive. That not, so basically that minus sign, you remember the linear stability thing? That coefficient, minus 1 minus phi, is as long as phi is between 0 and 1, that coefficient is negative. Okay, so in that in that 0, 1, 5 world, I said that there was a unique steady state. We can see that it's also stable. It's self-corrective. Okay, so that's good. Um, so that, that 0, 1 world makes perfect sense. Okay, um, <clears throat> okay, and then what about... Uh, Okay, so now there's the question of, okay, there's, if, if you think about this second row equation, you know, this, this is basically a quadratic form, okay, where, where there's two zeros, right? One zero, if you want to, you can even, if you, if you factor out um, a one minus five, then you get G eta N or one minus five minus G, right? Which is uh G times G star minus G. Okay, so you can, with these things, where if, if you have two steady states and things are kind of linear, you, you usually get like a quadratic form where it's like the difference from each of those. Okay, so um, in this case, you, you can see that it, it's really just, you can express it in terms of the steady state. Okay, but at the end of the day, this is a quadratic form that has two zeros. G equals zero. And wherever this thing is zero, which is where G equals that, that G star, which is eta n over one minus five. Okay, so um, the G equals zero one, I mean, we don't really need to worry about that because uh, <clears throat> first of all, it's unstable. You know, if you have any positive G, okay, and I guess we can, right, so what is this? This is, this is uh, we can plot G and G dot, okay. And this is, this should go negative. Okay, so what what is this going to look like? All right, at zero, it's zero. Okay, it's not going to go negative. Um, the the fact that that uh, you know there's that g that that's just the the raw g on the front means it's not going to go negative because if you as you approach zero, your changes get smaller and smaller. Okay, all right, so it's not going to go negative. This thing is a, a downward facing quadratic sort of deal um and it's going to cross again at g star so that's what it's going to look like and so you can see that this zero point is unstable this g star point crosses downward so it's stable All right so if it's, it's a well-behaved system okay four four five between zero and one okay um all right and so well that that's good it's good to know okay and then uh when phi, okay, well then when phi equals one, okay, then you just get that the growth rate of G is equal to eta times N. And that's where you kind of have to hope that N equals zero. Okay, so there you can see that that knife edge case. So the phi equals one, sometimes it's called a knife edge case because it, it's sort of non-generic. You need phi exactly equal to one, okay? Um, Okay, and then we can also now think about phi greater than one. Okay, this and so I'm, I'm almost out of time. That's a greater than sign. Now we can think about phi greater than one. When phi is greater than one, <clears throat> this is no longer a downward facing quadratic. It's an upward facing quadratic, which means that, uh, well, um, I guess, does that mean that you can go to zero? Maybe you can, but I don't think you can. I didn't think about it, but Certainly, it opens up the possibility of, of accelerating out of control growth, right? Because you're going to be in a situation where you have a larger G uh, produces even bigger increases in the growth rate of G itself, okay? So essentially, this term would, is positive when phi is greater than 1, okay? It's, it's something plus some positive number times G, phi minus 1, basically. Um, so just out of control growth, okay? Um, and you can actually... You can show you can show that there is a literal singularity if, if you even if you say that n equals zero. So this is this is like a lower bound. If if, if you have no population growth and there's a singularity, if you have population growth, there's gonna be even more of a singularity. Okay, right. So so this is like a a, a baseline. Okay, so in that case, you have g dot when n equals zero. You have g dot is equal to basically 
phi minus 1 times g squared. All right, so the this n is 0. OK, that's 0. We're going to distribute that minus sign, so it's phi minus 1 times g times g, so it's g squared. OK, so this is the when you get actual squares on the function value, that's when you know you're in weird territory. You got squares on the, the x value that maybe you're okay, but with the, with the y value, you're, or the f value, that, that's when things are funky. Um, <clears throat> and remember this, the definition of this g dot is dg dt. Okay, that's, we're going to need that. All right, so this, we're going to do this, like, this weird cheating thing. I don't know if I did this before, but you, where you kind of, like, move the dts around. Okay, it, like, kind of works. Okay, so what we're going to do is, move the dt to the other side and just separate terms based on whether they're g related or t related okay so we're going to get dg over g squared is equal to phi minus one times t no dt dt okay so i moved the dt over i moved the g squared over the other side so now we have something on the left that's just g related and on the right is just like well a, con a phi constant or parameter uh times dt okay um I think I learned this trick in the in the Echebuglu book, in, in the textbook. So we can blame Echebuglu for this, okay? Because the mathematicians wouldn't be happy. Um, but what you can do is you can integrate both sides, remembering to have a constant of integration, okay? And if you integrate the left, you're going to get minus one over g I'll say of t now, okay? And if you integrate the right, you're going to get phi minus one times t, and then plus some constant capital C. Okay. All right, so this this is an equation now. This, this specifying g of t. Okay. We just need to find what c is, and then we can, we're all set. All right. So, and then we'll solve for g of t. Okay. But first of all, what is c? Well, c, there's some initial growth rate. Right. So g of zero, let's just say some g zero. You, it's just you calculate what's the the... R, what's the A? Plug it in, you're going to get some G0. Okay, we don't need to worry about what it is, some positive number. So if if G of 0 is G sub 0, well, if we evaluate this to find C, then we just get 1 over G0 minus 1 over G0 is equal to 0 plus C. Right, so that means that C <clears throat> is equal to minus 1 over G sub 0. Okay. Which means that if we we can plug that in, t plus or minus actually minus one over g sub zero. Okay. All right. So that's our equation. Okay. And then the last thing we need to do is just solve for g of t. Okay. So uh, how we can do that? Well, we're gonna multiply by minus one. The uh, multiplicative inverse, the additive inverse, one of those two. Then we're going to do one over both sides too. The other way, inverse, whatever that is. Okay, and we're going to get g of t. All right, so we're just going to do that all at once. Okay, so then we get <clears throat> one over uh, one over g zero minus five minus one times t. Okay, so we're just solving for g of t. Okay, and then. Um, yeah, and if you want, you can multiply by g0 on top and bottom. So you can get 1. g0 over 1 minus 5 minus 1 times g0 times t. Okay. So, yeah, oh, I'm over time. I wanted to finish this up. What do you get? It's a singularity. As t approaches uh, 1, if t is 0, then it's g0. As t approaches 1 over 5 minus 1 times g0 over both of them, that new denominator explodes. I mean, it goes to zero, so the whole thing explodes. Okay, so it's going to look like, um, I guess I'll go over here, it's going to look like, you know, start at some level, and then in finite time, you get infinite growth, and hence infinite output. Okay, so this is like, so it, it really is singularity. Um, I think that's enough to say this probably ain't happening, right? So we're not going to get uh, infinite growth in finite time. Okay, so so that's that's the the outcome for phi greater than one. It seems like it's very explosive and, and, and kind of 
a non-realistic. So we're going to exclude phi, phi greater than one. Okay, so that's it. That's the phi, those are the three cases for phi we've excluded. One of them, we're going to stick with usually phi equals one, and then and then we'll have a little four a's into phi less than one world uh, on occasion. Okay. All right, so that's it. Um, yeah, I'll post those midterm solutions tonight, and then uh, get them back to you graded next week. And uh, yeah, and I'll see you on Thursday.